Last week, we began a series of studies on the person and work of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Last Sunday, our message was really more about his person. We saw that the Holy Spirit is a power to be appropriated, but he's also a person to be appreciated. The Holy Spirit is not an impersonal force. He's not just divine energy. In fact, the Holy Spirit is God. He is the third person of the Godhead and should be treated as such with all of the uh, honor and respect that goes with the fact that he is divine. This week I'd like to focus a little bit more on his work, what he has done, what he continues to do. And in doing so, I want to use the, the idea of a resume. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with a resume. It's a, a little history about yourself. It, it lists your work experience, perhaps your education that's related, uh, your skills, your credentials. That word resume actually comes from a French word to summarize. And that's what I'd like to do this morning. I'd like to give you just a a brief summary of the work of the Holy Spirit throughout Scripture. And we're going to look at uh, three aspects of his work. We're going to look at the previous work of the Spirit, Spirit. And what I mean by previous is before Christ came. So this will be primarily dealing in the Old Testament. We're also going to look at the promised work of the Spirit. This is what the Old Testament saints looked forward to. And then finally, we're going to look at the present work of the Spirit, and that is from the time of Christ's death, resurrection, and ascension onward, and see how the Holy Spirit works in the life of the believer today. Those of you who have heard me preach and teach know that I stress the unity of the Scriptures, the Old and the New Testaments. I believe that both are equally inspired by God, both are equally necessary for us to understand who God is and what he expects of us. Uh, I bristle when I hear people say, uh, well, you know, that's the law and we're under grace, as if the Old Testament doesn't matter anymore. And it's just simply not true. It is all of God's word. I very much believe in the continuity of the Old and the New Testaments more than in their contrast. But in this case, there is an exception. When we get to the work of the Holy Spirit, there is a definite distinction between his work prior to Christ's death and resurrection and after. And we're going to see later on why that was the case. Now, his person has not changed. The Holy Spirit is eternal He had never had a beginning. He'll never have an ending. He has always been God. He does not change in his essence. But the way in which he works in those who trust in God has changed significantly. And that's something I want to talk about this morning. So I want to begin with the previous work of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Old Testament does not provide... Uh, a systematic theology of the Holy Spirit. In fact, the term Holy Spirit only appears twice. Once in Psalm 51 and once in Isaiah 63. Uh, Now, often you will hear of the Spirit of the Lord, the Spirit of God, and yes, that's all referring to the same person. Uh, But you do not have an awful lot of detail regarding the person of the Holy Spirit. But that is not to say that he was not at work before the coming of Christ. He very much was. We see him throughout the pages of the Old Testament. He was ceaselessly active in the creation of the universe, in revelation, in regenerating believers, in equipping people for special tasks. So I'd just like to take a few moments and and go over uh, briefly the previous work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to limit ourselves this morning to three areas of his work. Remember, this is a resume. This isn't a complete biography. So uh, we we are going to limit ourselves to these three. 
The first is found in Exodus chapter 31. Exodus 31, beginning in verse 1. Then the Lord said to Moses, See, I have chosen Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with the Spirit of God, with skill, ability, and knowledge in all kinds of crafts, to make artistic designs for work in gold, silver, and bronze, to cut and set stones, to work in wood, and to engage in all kinds of craftsmanship. What we see in this passage is that the Holy Spirit provided skill to certain workmen in order to complete a specific task. One commentator points out, in early Old Testament days, every form of skill and strength and excellence is directly credited to the Spirit of God. This is because God is rightly seen as the source of all wisdom. Every talent, every ability we have is God-given. And in the Old Testament, they credited that to the person and work of the Holy Spirit. This same equipping is seen when Solomon built the temple as craftsmen were enabled to perform incredible work through the power of God. Warren Wiersbe writes, whether it's for building the tabernacle in the Old Testament building the church in the New Testament, or building our lives and ministries today, the Holy Spirit of God must equip us and enable us to do the job. He will enable us to do things we simply cannot do on our own. And I think we need to acknowledge that He is the one who provides skill in our various uh, areas of our lives. Now secondly the Holy Spirit provided strength. We see this first in Judges chapter 15. The story of Samson. You remember Samson, right? Judges 15, beginning in verse 14, as he approached Lehi, the Philistines came toward him shouting, The Spirit of the Lord came upon him in power. The ropes on his arms became like charred flax, and the bindings dropped from his hands. Finding a fresh jawbone of a donkey, he grabbed it and struck down a thousand men. Normally, you would think that a thousand against one are pretty lopsided odds. In this case, they were against the thousand. And only through the strength of the Spirit of God could Samson hope to do anything like that. I have this theory about Samson. I'm not sure how many people share it, but if you were to, if you were to produce a movie about Samson, what kind of actor would you cast in the role? Now, I I realize this is kind of dated because I'm not really up on who's uh, as popular today, but probably somebody like The Rock, right? Okay? I'm thinking Arnold Schwarzenegger, some great big guy, muscles on top of muscles. You know, that'd be a great Samson, right? I don't think that's what Samson looked like at all. I think Samson looked very ordinary. He might have been the ancient Hebrew version of a pencil neck geek, Right? He just had really long hair. You see, if he looked like some great big weightlifter, power lifter kind of guy with all these muscles, nobody would have said, I wonder how he does that. But when Samson would do something amazing, like pick up the gates of a city and carry them up a hill, people were like, how could that guy do this? I think he was a very ordinary guy. But when the Spirit came on him, he became like a a superhero. And he could do these amazing things. Why? Because the Spirit of God provided strength. You also see this uh, in 1 Samuel 11, verses 6 and 7. Here we're talking about King Saul. When Saul heard their words, the Spirit of God came upon him in power. 
and he burned with anger. He took a pair of oxen, cut them into pieces, and sent the pieces by messengers throughout Israel, proclaiming, this is what will be done to the oxen of anyone who does not follow Saul and Samuel. Then the terror of the Lord fell on the people, and they turned out as one man. Here again, the Spirit of God comes on Saul in power. He provided strength. The terminology is also used of David when he was anointed to be king by Samuel. 1 Samuel 16, 13, So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. And you see, throughout his life, there were times when David was infused with this divine power to accomplish that which God had wanted him to do. So you can see from these Old Testament passages that the Holy Spirit came upon certain people at certain times to perform a specific task by imparting supernatural skill or strength. Now a third and very important work of the Spirit is in prompting Scripture. It was the Holy Spirit that spoke through the prophets and who induced the various authors of Scripture to write down the words of the Lord. You find one example of this in Ezekiel 11, verse 5. Prophet Ezekiel says, Then the Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and he told me to say, This is what the Lord says. This is what you are saying, O house of Israel, and I know what's going through your mind. The Spirit of the Lord comes upon Ezekiel and instructs him in exactly what he wants Ezekiel to say. And this was the norm for prophets as they spoke. Uh, We see this uh, later on in the New Testament as Paul writes in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17... All scripture is God-breathed and is profitable or useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. That idea of God-breathed, in the ancient languages of Hebrew and Greek, breath and spirit are the same word. And it was the Spirit of God who inspired these writers of scripture and these prophets so that the words they spoke and the words they recorded were indeed the words of God. You see this even uh, more specifically mentioned in 2 Peter 1, verses 20 and 21. Peter writes, Above all, you must understand that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Meaning, somebody didn't just sit down and say, Well, today I'm going to write Scripture. And they just start writing off the top of their head. No. Prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God, how? As they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. It's the idea of a sail, that the wind catches the sail and then moves the boat. The Spirit of God moved these men to say and to write the very words of God. In this context, prophecy is not just talking about foretelling the future. Uh, Prophecy specifically is speaking forth God's word. It's saying, thus says the Lord. And the reason those prophets could say that is because the Spirit of God was guiding them and prompting what we have as Scripture today. And this is why we can trust the Bible. This is why we can put our faith in God's written revelation because this is not just the writings of man thousands of years ago. This is indeed the word of God. But something was missing. Something just wasn't all there prior to the coming of Christ. On the whole, you had to be someone rather special in the Old Testament to have the Spirit of God a prophet, a national leader, a king, uh, perhaps some particularly wise person or or, uh, artistic kind of person. 
in which case you would be uh, beautifying the Lord's tent of meeting or enunciating the Lord's wisdom. But the Spirit of God wasn't just for everyone back then. And you'll also note that he didn't stay. He would come upon the person for that particular task, and then he would leave. You do not see in the Old Testament what we see in the New Testament as the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. He didn't come up and take residence. It's always put in the terms of he came upon someone. He didn't set up residence within them. And as we're going to see in a little bit, that is what he does today. But we see hints of that. We see the promised work of the Spirit in the pages of the Old Testament. In Numbers chapter 11, Moses is leading the people of Israel through the wilderness. The responsibility was really taking its toll. I mean, this is one man leading what some scholars believe may have been up to two million people. And they were not an easy people to lead. (laughs) They were constantly complaining and griping and moaning and... It's amazing to me Moses hadn't pulled all of his hair out by this time. So in Numbers chapter 11, beginning in verse 24, we read, So Moses went out and told the people what the Lord had said. He brought together 70 of the elders and had them stand around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke with them, and he took the spirit that was on Moses and put the Spirit on the seventy elders. When the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied, but they did not do so again. That idea of prophesying when the Spirit of the Lord came on them, we're going to look at that more in depth next Sunday. However, two men, whose names were Eldad and Medad, had remained in the camp They were listed among the elders, but did not go out to the tent. Yet the Spirit of God rested on them, and they prophesied in the camp. A young man ran up to Moses and said, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. Joshua, the son of Nun, who had been Moses' aide since youth, spoke up and said, Moses, my Lord, stop them. But Moses replied, are you jealous for my sake? I wish that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. Then Moses and the elders of Israel returned to the camp. Did you catch Moses' longing in those last words? I wish all of Israel were prophets. I wish the spirit were on all of them. That's what was missing. At this point, he wasn't. He wasn't able to, for reasons we'll see in a moment. Now Moses' wish was later addressed in the prophets with this promised work of the Spirit. Jeremiah and Ezekiel both longed for the day of a new covenant, which would be marked by a new working of the Holy Spirit. One of the well-known promises of the Spirit is found in the little minor prophet of Joel. Joel chapter 2, verses 28 and 29 The Lord says, and afterward I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your old men will dream dreams, your young men will see visions. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days. See, this promised work of the spirit would not be limited to just a few people. Now, when he says, I will pour out my spirit on all people, understand he's only speaking of believers. He's not speaking of unbelievers here. But the day was coming when the spirit of God would not only rest upon a choice few temporarily until a task was completed. He would be poured out on all of God's people, all those who have placed their faith in him. And that was a sign that a new age was dawning, that something new was happening in in God's people, and it was something the people looked forward to. John the Baptist 
spoke of this promised work of the Spirit. In Matthew 3.11, we read his words, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me will come one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I am not fit to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. We're going to look at the baptism of the Spirit in our next message in depth. But here is this promise that one is coming who is going to introduce a new working of the Holy Spirit. One that was prophesied in the Old Testament. One that would be unlimited among the family of God. And it looks for the coming of the Messiah to put that in. Jesus promised his disciples the Holy Spirit, but only after he had returned to heaven. You may remember that following his resurrection, during those days that he met with his disciples before his ascension, he said that the Spirit would come upon them. Even before his death in the upper room, in John 16, 7, he says, I tell you the truth, it is good for you that I'm going away. Unless I go away, the Counselor, which was how Jesus referred to the Spirit here, will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. In Luke 24, 49, Jesus said, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Here's a a, a reference to this promise And what is that promise? Acts 1.8 says you will receive power when? When the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And we know that on the day of Pentecost, ten days after his ascension into heaven, the Holy Spirit came upon the disciples with power. But it was something new. It was not the way that it used to be. The Spirit's ministry and the experience of the believer would never be the same as before. So now what is the present work of the Holy Spirit? Now this again is not going to be an exhaustive list, but but I want to hit some highlights of what the Spirit does in our lives today. First of all, the Spirit saves us. You say, wait a minute, how about Jesus saves Well, he does. (laughs) Remember, we're talking about two persons of the Godhead, and there's only one God. But the Holy Spirit has a definite work in salvation. 2 Thessalonians 2.13 says, But we ought always to thank God for you, brothers loved by the Lord, because from the beginning God chose you to be saved through the sanctifying work of the Spirit and through belief in the truth. So the Spirit of God is at work in our salvation. Titus 3, verses 4 through 7. But when the kindness and love of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not by the righteous things we had done, but by cause of his mercy. He saved us through the washing of rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. Once again, the Spirit of God is at work in our salvation whom he poured out generously on us through Jesus Christ, our Savior, so that having been justified by his grace, we might become heirs of the hope of eternal life. You remember that Jesus spoke of being born again, being born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is very active in our salvation. Secondly, the Spirit seals us. Ephesians 1, verses 13 and 14 And you were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. Notice, we were marked with a seal. Now, this is not a seal of approval. This is a seal of ownership. Back in those days, if you wanted to prove something was yours, you would put a stamp on it. You would seal it. And that meant it was yours. Well, God has sealed us. 
He has put a seal of ownership on our lives, and that seal is the Spirit of God who lives in us. He uses similar language in 2 Corinthians 5, 5. Now it is God who has made us for this very purpose and has given us his spirit as a deposit, guaranteeing what is to come. You and I know that our lives here on earth are not ideal. We still live in sin-cursed bodies. We still live in a sin-cursed earth. We still deal with temptation. We still deal with the consequences of sin. We don't have what we ultimately will have, but what we do have in this life as believers in Christ is the Spirit of God living in us, and it's a guarantee of what's to come. It shows us that we will indeed be with God forever in heaven. Third, the Spirit sanctifies us. You see this both in Romans 15, verse 16, In 1 Peter 1, verse 2, it talks about the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. That word sanctify literally means to be set apart for a special use. But included in that is the cleansing that is necessary in order to be used by God. God is not going to use a filthy vessel. The Spirit of God works in cleansing us and keeping us clean so that we can be used by God. It also means that the Spirit of God is transforming us, changing us to become more like Christ. That's really what Christian maturity is all about. We are changed into His image and His likeness. Fourth, the Spirit settles in us. And this is where we see the biggest difference from the work of the Holy Spirit before and the work of the Holy Spirit after Christ came, died, and rose again. He lives within us. Going back to that upper room, the night before Jesus went to the cross, John 14, verses 16 and 17 record, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you, and catch this, and will be in you. When you place your trust in Jesus Christ, when you commit your life to him, the Holy Spirit immediately comes inside you and lives within you. This is the fullness of the new covenant. The Spirit of God lives within us. This is why Jesus said, it's better for you that I go away. If Jesus had stayed on earth, and he could have, by rights, he could still be walking the earth today. But he'd be limited to one place at one time. And he could teach, and he could inspire, but there's nothing inside us. But when Jesus went to heaven, the Spirit came down, and the Spirit lives in us. So it's not just a matter of us trying harder. It's not a matter of us turning over a new leaf and trying to better ourselves. You know, one of the most popular uh, areas of literature today is in self-improvement. Christianity isn't about self-improvement. It's about spirit improvement. The Spirit of God does the work as we allow Him. He gives us the strength to do what God wants us to do. And it's not just for a short time for a specific task. It's every day. We have the Spirit of God living within us every single day. And He is available to do God's work if we will allow him to. And so you see how the Spirit of God has worked, how he continues to work in our lives. I realize this is only a selective compilation of the work of the Spirit. He does much more of this. We're going to see that later on in this series, the work that he does in our lives. But I just want to give you an idea of how the Spirit of God works, and particularly how His work changed. 
after the death, the resurrection, and the ascension of Christ. Now you might wonder, why? Why the difference? Why didn't the Holy Spirit just indwell every believer during the Old Testament times? And there's a specific reason for that. The key to this is in the word holy. He is the Holy Spirit. And holy has the connotation of clean, absolutely clean. God is pure. Throughout the Old Testament, God is a holy God. Some even say that is his central attribute. Everything else comes out of his holiness. We are sinful. We are the exact opposite of holy. And in his holiness, God cannot stand sin. Sin cannot survive in his presence. Now, before Jesus came as the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world, God allowed the people to offer animal sacrifices as a substitution. It was preparing the way for Jesus to come as the ultimate Lamb of God. But these sacrifices could not cleanse sin away. The Bible says that it covered over their sin. And Hebrews 10.4 tells us it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. This was a temporary arrangement God had established until he sent his son. But now that Christ has come, 1 John 1.7 tells us the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. It not only covers it over, it takes it away. And when the sin is taken away from our lives, the Holy Spirit can come in and live within us. That's why there was a difference. But for us today, those of us who take the name of Jesus Christ, when we have trusted in him as our Lord and Savior, his spirit lives within us. There's no such thing as a super saint. When we talk about the spirit of God living in and working in the life of a believer. We're not just talking about preachers or missionaries or Bible scholars or whatever. This is for every believer. Remember the promise of Joel, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. It is for every single one of us. And every message that we go through in this series is for every one of you who takes the name of Jesus Christ. The Spirit of God lives in you. He wants to work in you. It is just that simple. He is in every one of us. So the Holy Spirit presents to you his resume today. You have heard of his previous work before Christ, his present work since Christ. You've been introduced to the main areas of his work. He saves He seals, he sanctifies, he settles in the life of the believer. The only remaining question is this. Will you allow the Spirit of God to work in your life? Will you give him access to your thoughts, to your emotions, to your will? Will you surrender your body to be used by the Spirit of God, not only to please ourselves, but to please Him and to be used by Him. And that is a question only you can answer. Will you bow with me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the work of your Holy Spirit, that He comes and lives within each of us as we have placed our faith in your son, Jesus. Father, we understand and appreciate his presence in our lives. Now we dedicate ourselves, we open up ourselves and give the spirit free reign to work in us as he wills. I pray that he would guide our thoughts, that he would guide our words, 
our actions so that we might become more like Jesus Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.